first thing I want to tell you is this. Um, if, if the statistics that you see from our federal government are correct, one in five people are impacted by sexual assault on college campuses. Does that make sense? So I don't know how many people we have in this room, but one in five is a high number. All right. So don't think for a second that this doesn't, uh, doesn't impact you in some way because if the stats are even close, you know somebody that's been impacted by this. All right. The other thing that I want to make clear is that sexual assault is not just a rape. Sexual assault is any sexual intimacy um, that, that, is put on, that, that is done to someone that they don't want. All right. So we're not just talking about violent, violent physical rape. If somebody is hold, uh, holding your hand, kissing you on the cheek, you know, and you've asked them to stop doing that and they continue to do that, that can be considered sexual assault, all right? Um, and so what I want you to understand is this is something that's very serious. It's something that the federal government, everybody is making a priority of this on college campuses, all right? So I'm going to, I'm not, this is not going to be exhaustive, but hopefully it is going to give you enough information to know kind of what's going on maybe how you can safeguard yourself, how you can report it if you feel like something's happened to you. And again, just give you some information to have you, have you kind of know what's going on, all right? So uh, first of all, Title IX, don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but Title IX is one of the greatest things that's ever happened in our country. It's why our women's basketball team gets the same amount of stuff as our men's basketball team, all right? Um, it states from 1972, it's an amendment to the Federal Education Act that says no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So what does that mean? It's saying women need to be treated equally, all right? Now, I went to this horrible university called East Central, all right? I graduated from there, it was terrible, all right? I hate them. But um, when I was there, our women's teams, and this is 100 years ago, our women's teams did not have locker rooms. Like our women's softball team didn't have the same kind of locker room as the men's team. Everybody got me on that? Like our women's soccer team, I, I, they didn't have a locker room. They just dressed at their room and kind of came down to practice. So obviously East Central is in violation of Title IX. Everybody got me on that? Okay, equality for women in all educational institutions. Now, in 2014, a task force in the, in the federal government under the authority of Title IX, all right, the White House unveiled the task force to protect students from sexual assault. So under Title IX Equal Protection, the White House created a tax force, all right, and this provided practical instructions, instructions for colleges to identify, prevent, and respond to sexual assault. So what, what was being said basically is women on campuses, men on campuses need to be protected under the law uh, from sexual assault, and, and colleges and universities need to be active in stopping this. We on the same page? Everybody good? All right. The report makes clear that the federal government will take a harder line on enforcing Title IX Again, which outlines colleges' legal obligations to prevent, investigate, and resolve reports of sexual assault, whether or not law enforcement authorities get involved. Now, that's probably the key thing you need to understand here. The report makes clear the federal government will take a harder line on enforcing Title IX, which outlines colleges' legal obligations to prevent, investigate, and resolve reports of sexual assault, whether or not law enforcement authorities are involved. So what we're talking about with this task force, we're not talking about the DA in Bryan County. Does everybody understand that? This is at Southeastern Oklahoma State. This is at the University of Oklahoma. This is at the University of Tulsa. These are guidelines that are separate from the law that you would receive off campus. Everybody understand that? Okay. Now, what does, if anybody's familiar with government at all, what happens to a university if they don't enact the things the task force wanted them to act, enact. What happens? Does anybody know? So let's just say Southeastern said, you know, you guys are crazy. We're not going to mess with this. What happens to Southeastern? They lose federal funding, which that can be your Pell Grant. That could, they, they could say Southeastern can't accept Pell Grant. We're not going to put any money into Southeastern because they're not following Title IX. Uh, they, they have not created a, 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 a sexual assault task force. All right, so the colleges have a huge investment because they're going to lose money if they don't do this. Everybody good? Okay, Southeastern's policy, all right? So we're not talking about the DA Bryan County, we're talking here on campus, okay? Upon hearing a complaint, an investigation will be conducted by a non-biased Title IX coordinator. So if someone is sexually assaulted on campus, they will go to the non-biased Title IX coordinator. Now, on our campus, that is Dr. Claire Stubblefield, okay? I can get this, this information to you if you need it, all right? The deputy Title IX coordinators are Dr. Uh, Brian Clark and then uh, Ms. Wilmoth, okay? So 
if you were to, if you had an issue and you had a complaint, you would go see Dr. Claire Stubblefield. That's who you would report it to. All right. So if there is a sexual assault accusation, that person goes to Dr. Claire Stubblefield, and again, upon re receiving the complaint, she will investigate the accusation. Everybody got me on that? Again, if you want this information, I can get that to you. Also, you guys probably had the opportunity to take, I believe, a survey maybe or something from Haven at the beginning of the semester. Do you guys remember that? That's, that's part of this policy to train faculty, students about sexual assault, about our policy. All right, and, we're, and we used Haven uh, to, to do the, those things, okay? So you've already done that. Yes, does somebody say something? All right, so you've already done that this semester. Like if you haven't, like you all hold on all your stuff and you can't graduate or whatever, right? So you've got to get that done if you haven't. But you, you talked to Ms. Stubblefield, you've done the training. All of that stuff is because of, um, because of Title IX and, and having to um, kind of comply with uh, the regulations there for sexual assault. So again, continue the investigation. When Ms. Stubblefield gets an accusation, the investigation will include meeting personally with the complainant, meeting personally with the respondents, meeting personally with any witnesses, and reviewing any relevant evidence. The Title IX coordinator will determine if a Title IX conduct hearing is possible based on the available information. So did you hear anything about the police? Did the police get involved? This has nothing to do with any of that. This is on campus at Southeastern Oklahoma State University. If somebody feels like they've been sexually assaulted, they contact Ms. Stubblefield, she does an investigation, and from that moment on, she decides if there needs to be a hearing. Okay, at the hearing, if she decides there needs to be one, if there's enough evidence to proceed with the hearing, the accused will be called before a committee established by the university to hear the case. All right, that could, that could be faculty members. Dr. Stubblefield is in charge of that, and it's within the, the policy that we have on campus. Okay, and I don't know exactly the details of how they do the committee. All right, the hearing will include opening statements, uh, presentation of the investigation report, information about the incident, all right, so you're in front of this panel, these are the people hearing it, presentation of the information by the witnesses, and closing statements. So you basically kind of have a court set up on campus at Southeastern. Ms. Stubblefield will bring the case based on the accusation, and then you have a panel that hears the case. Everybody good? Okay. All right. At these hearings, each party is permitted to have a person of their choosing accompany, accompany them throughout the hearing as an advisor. Okay, through, through the hearing as an advisor, right? This is not the court of law. Obviously, I'm sure from a legal standpoint, if you had a lawyer, you know, you might be able to, to get out of it and all those things. But again, this is all new, so I can't answer those questions specifically about that. All right. All parties are determined to make statements, present witnesses and information during the hearing. So you are able to stand up and defend yourself against accusations or bring in, uh, or bring information if, if you're accusing. All right. The hearing panel will make a, a determination of the policy violation and, if any, the appropriate sanctions. All right. So this panel will hear all the information. They will determine, all right, at the hearing whether the person is guilty or not. Everybody got me. We're not at Bryan County Court of Law. The police have not been called. This is Southeastern Oklahoma State University. All right. Now listen. The standard of proof used in all university hearings, uh, hearings is in preponderance of the evidence which means the determination to be made is whether it is more likely than not a violation has occurred. This is significantly different than proof beyond a reasonable doubt, which is required for a criminal prosecution. So you've all heard that, like you got, you're, you're innocent until proven guilty and all that stuff, right? Again, on campus, on the campuses all across the country, if you're accused of sexual assault, it's determined that you need to go before the panel. If the panel determines that there's a preponderance of evidence, which means the determination to be made is whether it is more likely or not a violation has occurred, more likely or not. It's not like nine jurors saying yes, or 12, or whatever. Everybody got me on that? So again, it's not, the, the, the in order to be found guilty, the, the bar is not really high in terms of the evidence brought. If there's just even a possibility that it happened, you could be found guilty. And again, not guilty in law, but guilty on campus. Is everybody with me on this? I'm getting to my point here, all right? Now, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I'm not sitting up here saying that's bad, all right? Uh, I have 100% confidence and faith that's in Southeastern and the people running it. Nobody wants to see anybody get in trouble. Uh, we want to protect people who feel like they've been sexually assaulted. There will be a fairness to the process. But the reality is it, it's not like a court of law. It's a totally different, um, it's a totally different thing. You've got to be aware of that, all right? Um, 
when it's determined that sexual misconduct is more than likely, uh, more likely than not to have occurred, and again, that's kind of the demarcation line, uh, the outcome can include suspension or expulsion. So if it's found that you more than likely committed sexual assault, the outcome can include suspension or expulsion. All right? Both parties do have the right to be informed in writing of the outcome. Both parties have the right to appeal the decision reached throughout the hearing proceedings to the Committee on Student Conduct, conduct within 24 hours after the notification of the hearing outcome. All right? So if, if, you, if you are found uh, um, that, there, that it was more likely to a not that you committed sexual assault, you get suspended within 24 hours, you can, um, you can um, go to the committee and appeal. All right? Uh, and if you brought accusations they found them not guilty, you can go to the committee and appeal. All right? Now, the ramifications of this, all right? And this is what I kind of wanted to get to. Again, the law regarding sexual assault outside of here has not changed. However, how re universities respond to, investigate, and discipline students for sexual assault and accusations of sexual assault has changed dramatically, okay? Um, you, if you... If you put yourself in a position to be sexually intimate with somebody else, and I'm not just saying sex, if you put yourself on a college campus in a position of being sexually intimate with somebody else that maybe you don't know well or whatever the case may be, you are putting yourself at risk of just one misstep, somebody taking you to that committee and saying, hey, they kissed me and I didn't want that to happen. Now you may say that's far-fetched, but the reality is the amount of evidence needed to find you uh, guilty of sexual assault on campus is much less than in the court of law. Does everybody hear me on that? Now again, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I want everybody protected. Uh, I want women on our campuses to be protected from sexual assault. I want men on our campuses to be protected from sexual assault. And it can happen both ways. So I'm not saying this is a bad thing. But what I am telling you is if you are having sexual relationships or sexual intimacy with people that you do not know, you are putting yourself at a huge, huge risk. Does everybody understand that? Okay, I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. Uh, that just this is the real world. Based on the preponderance of evidence in these in these uh, panels and those kind of things, if you don't give a verbal consent to every step of sexual intimacy, at any point you don't say yes verbally, a person can go back and say I never said yes verbally. And guess what? It's possible that you you get accused of sexual assault. Does everybody understand what that means? So, if you're making out with the person, you're kissing them, and you want it to go on to the next level, theoretically, and not even theoretically, because these things have happened, if you don't say, may I move on to the next step, and you hear them say yes, this can happen. Does everybody understand that? I mean, it, this is stuff that has happened. I'm not just making this up. Everybody got me? The other thing, drugs and alcohol. If you have any kind of sexual intimacy with somebody who is under uh, the influence of drugs or alcohol, even if they can sit verbally every step of the way, they can come back later and say, you know, I, just, I, was, out of, I was out of my mind. I, I, I wasn't interested in that. That was sexual assault. I was drunk. I didn't know what was going on. Does everybody understand that? I mean, this is the real deal now. You're putting yourself in a position, all right, really to lose some of your future if you're enjoying graduating from Southeastern and playing out play sports here. And again, it's not just men and it's not just women. This is for everybody. Has everybody got me on that? Last thing I'll talk to you about is this. Just, this is real life. Frank Shannon, a linebacker at the University of Oklahoma, was accused of sexual assault in the spring of 2014. Okay? The Cleveland County District Attorney, where Norman is at, did not file charges against Frank Shannon. There were no charges filed. The alleged victim did not bring charges against Frank Shannon. All right? Because of the things we talked about today, the university is obligated to investigate and make a rule. They ruled that Frank Shannon was ineligible for the next season. Everybody understand that? Again, nothing happened in court. No, 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 the, the, the person that, um, again, obviously the, the person that accused him of sexual assault told the university but did not take it to Cleveland County. All right? So, again, I'm just telling you, as, as strongly as I can, this is a very high priority in our federal government. It's made it a high priority at all colleges and universities. And for your safety and for your life, you need to be incredibly careful and you need to treat people with respect. You need to love other people, all right? And we all ought to be like that as human beings, right? But please be careful about putting yourselves in situations uh, that can go downhill, all right? And so, again, I'm not trying to scare anybody into anything. 
But what I do want you to know is every time you put yourself in a position that, of sexual intimacy, you've got to be incredibly careful. All right? And there's probably some wisdom into maybe knowing a person before you do that. All right? Um, and and you, you just got to, you've got to watch yourself. And that's not just guys and that's not just girls. That's everybody. Okay? Does everybody kind of understand the sexual assault policy to some extent here in southeastern Oklahoma State? And again, this is not every detail. If you have questions, um, I can get you the link to the, all, every, all 20 something pages of the document, or I can't remember how many pages it was, but um, any information you need from me, please feel free to let me know. And most importantly, if you feel like you have been a victim of sexual assault, immediately talk to a coach, a counselor, um, call Dr. Stubblefield, make sure that you get the help that you need to, to get through that and get things taken care of, okay?